So I'm Ben Kligler. I don't know if I can go backwards. I don't think I can go backwards. But I'm uh, Vice Chair of, Family, of uh, Integrative Medicine, which is a department at the hospital now. Um, and are you guys fellows or residents, or who, how do you fit in? I'm a pain fellow. Pain fellow? A research fellow. Research fellow? I'm a observer from China. Oh, great. You're a visiting observer. Yeah. Great. Excellent. OK. So we'll see who else shows up. So um, my goal with you guys today, hey, how are you? is to cover what we describe as the integrative approach to pain. And when we talk about integrative, um, we used to talk a lot about CAM, complementary alternative medicine, et cetera. We still use those words a lot, but now we're really using this term integrative much more, which means it's not like the, these other therapies are out there in left field and it's something patients do on their own and we don't know anything about it. Really, the goal is to bring all this together as part of a more integrated approach, since we know from lots of data patients are doing it anyway. Uh, the idea is we, as conventional docs, should know about it and then have enough um, kind of basis in it to feel comfortable advising. So we're going to talk about these examples of uh, uh, CAM or alternative therapies as part of an integrative approach, nutritional, manual therapies, mind, body, and acupuncture. Um, interestingly, you, I don't know if you guys read this regularly, but here's pain you know, from January, there's a little review of complementary alternative medicine and chronic pain. So obviously, as you guys move forward as pain docs, this is something that's going to be part of your repertoire, and you, you, you certainly will be able to incorporate it more or less as you go along. Now, also interestingly, though, these guys chose to review a number of therapies that really are entirely different from what I chose. I chose kind of what I view as more the mainstays of integrative medicine. Um, they sort of picked a few little um, uh, more slightly more boutique -y, uh, treatments like magnets, etc., cetera, um, which to some degree goes to illustrate the scope of the field. I mean, we're really talking about many, many very well-developed and widely practiced disciplines that kind of go into this field. So this is just going to be a little overview. It's not by any means comprehensive. I sort of have focused it on chronic low back pain because that's a lot of where the best evidence is in terms of what's been published. So um, that doesn't mean there aren't applications in neuropathic pain or cancer-related pain. or and, and so each of those really is a different, uh, a different talk, a different set of, uh, of, uh, uh, of evidence uh, if you want that. Uh, so obviously this is stuff that you know, but this really goes into the basis of uh, what is the integrative approach to pain. The idea is that pharmacology is one part of it, but that if we're only doing pharmacology, we are going to fall short in the potential for what we can offer patients, and really truthfully, even in terms of what the standard of care is now, and I'll illustrate for you guys why that is. Uh, based on some of the evidence. But the idea is if we're only offering medications for pain control and not offering manual therapies, uh, uh, mind-body therapies, these other approaches, there's, I mean, I don't know how the pain field feels about it, but uh, in terms of clearly where we're going, uh, the standard of care has evolved so that we're, we're going to be expected to have a, a more broad approach to uh, approaching chronic pain. So. Just a little bit of data. This is from CDC National Survey in 2007 uh, that looked at why people in the United States use complementary and alternative therapies, kind of lumping them all together. And what you can see is that the top four reasons on the left there, back pain, neck pain, joint pain, arthritis, pain. This is by far the, the, the leading reason why patients choose to go to acupuncture, go to chiropractic, do vitamin therapy, whatever. It's pain. And Kind of as a reflection of this, uh, you guys may or may not know, there's a branch at NIH called the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, or NCAM, which is charged with uh, developing evidence basis for this area. And they've identified pain as kind of one of the, if not the priority area for the, their next five-year plan. So there's going to be a, a lot of their funding is going to go towards pain-related research. So we're going to start off talking about my body medicine. I think. Uh, in some ways, this is a cornerstone of the integrative approach to pain. And if you're, if you're approaching a chronic pain patient without thinking about some dimension of this, uh, you're falling short. I know you guys already learn about this, and I know you have uh, Alessandra and that you do um, uh, incorporate this into your work. Uh, I guess one question I have is, do you feel like this gets into your inpatient pain consults, some kind of my body strategy? 
Not too much. Ron says not too much. Um, I actually am from Sloan. Uh -huh. Oh, really? So we use a lot of this, like, especially anxiety-driven pain, depression. Yeah. Yeah. So we've seen, we have, actually, I was doing a project also to see the reduction after, like, four to six weeks of integrative medicine. Like, in oh, really? Patients, Neat. How the opioids are coming down. Ah, oh, really? It's a significant effect. But Great. not in everybody in patients, which is anxiety-driven pain. Right. Like, multiple issues going on. We have, we're trying to develop a screening check. Yeah. Which patients would be appropriate based on that, so high reference rates. Great. So you know, in order to sort, in other words, yes, the, like which patients are, are good targets no for this. Like published criteria right. in American pain boards, like who should be referred. Right. So That's trying, really worthwhile. I'm doing I'm some research on a similar subject. Trying. Oh, really? Yeah, you, you sh we should get in touch. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because what I, I'm... I, but I'm like, as definition, skewed because we have a lot of cancer patients who are stage 4, stage 3. Yeah. I really wish I had a pool of patients which were non-cancer as well. Right. Because being from Sloan, like either people are NEDs or people are stage 3, 4. Right. On uh, experimental. It's a very people, specific of kind of pain. Right. Well, maybe we should talk about whether you want, if you're developing a screener or a tool, maybe we want to test it out in the outpatient. I mean, I know that Dr. Portnoy is very interested in research in this area, so... If we could think about how to do it, maybe we would want to then pilot it with the pain population here. We definitely see a, I'm seeing like definitely, I already have around 40 patients. Yeah. Good. Well, we'll give you a card afterwards. Don't go. Because I would love to talk about it. Because my research is actually using qualitative methods to try to sort out which patients are more likely to respond. Not just pain patients, but in a variety of conditions. Like so. the way we are seeing response. I'm sorry, I'm taking your time. It's okay, one more second. Go ahead. There's a drop in the uh, requirement and the pain grades. Every weekly we ask them to grade themselves morning, even mm -hmm. pain yep. scores. And right, and you're mostly <laughs> using mind-body therapies with them, uh, or you guys have actually, acupuncture there too? Uh, so most of them is acupuncture, mind-body music therapy. Uh -huh. uh, it's sometimes psychosis, uh, what do you call it, like in internal realization psychosis, sure. something like that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, let's keep going, and we'll talk more afterwards. What, what's your name? I'm Dhiraj. Dhiraj. Okay, great. So we'll make sure we talk. So um, I think you guys here at BI are better at incorporating this into the outpatient, you know, into the, in the clinic and outpatient pain treatment, because I know there are groups, et cetera. And, and, you know, one question I have is, wouldn't we be in good shape if we were able to bring some of this to inpatient consults, if there was a, a roving... A psychologist who could do brief hypnosis interventions or uh, a relaxation therapy. Hi. There is. There is. Oh. oh, you are great. But do you guys you guys do inpatient stuff too? Great. Excellent. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. All right. Well, I'm. Ah. Yeah. Good. So we're making progress. Excellent. I'm really glad. I didn't know you guys were available on inpatient service. That's great. Um, so does that mean, for example, not to get distracted, but if family medicine calls a pain consult, are they, um, is it kosher for them to say, please bring the psychology uh, intern? <laughs> okay, all right, we'll find out. Because um, I know, for example, I know, for example, on the, pa on the family medicine service, they're very open to bringing some of this stuff into the inpatient environment. We do get calls from within the pain service. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, great. Neat. So let's just talk for a minute about the evidence. Uh, this is here only because to impress you with the f how long the research in this area has been going on. This is from JAMA in 1996. It was an NIH panel looking at using mind-body therapies for chronic pain. And even in 1996, relaxation techniques, they found strong evidence for pain, hypnosis, strong evidence in cancer-related pain, etc. CBT at that point was kind of just taking off, so they had moderate evidence. I think this would probably be strong evidence now for certain pain conditions. So there's lots more since then. This is just to show you how long uh, we've been looking at this in a serious way. This is a systematic review from 2000, again, more or less to show you how long the information has been uh, mounting in this. Strong evidence, this looked at back pain specifically, strong evidence that mind-body therapies compared with wait list or usual care had a positive effect on pain and an effect on function. And they kind of lumped all these mind-body therapies together. Uh, there were not many head-to-head -head trials at that point to say biofeedback is better or worse than relaxation is better or worse than counseling. There still is a lack of head-to-head -head trials, and one of the things that's happening at NIH now is there's a big emphasis on comparative effectiveness research, where specific therapies are being compared as opposed to just comparing to a placebo, 
which is really good because, as you can imagine, constructing a good placebo control for uh, relaxation therapy or biofeedback is very difficult because since the therapy engages the patient, you know, how are you going to, um, uh, what's the placebo? Um, so one thing you should know, which I don't have in my slides, I don't want to forget to mention, uh, there's a website, which I don't know if you guys know about it, uh, it's connected with Stop Pain, it's called Healing Chronic Pain, have you guys seen that? Uh, it a, was a joint project between our department and the pain department six or eight years ago, and it's specifically aimed both at patients and practitioners. Maybe we'll bring it up at the end if we have time. Uh, and on there, on the front page, is a recorded relaxation exercise. It's about 15 minutes. It's very nice. It has slides that go with it. It's something you guys can access. It's something a patient could access. It's something you could send somebody home and say, take a look at this at home, listen to this tape. It's very nicely done. Uh, I'll show it to you guys afterwards if we can. Um, so that's a resource that we've created right here in-house with your department, and um, I think it's quite underutilized. I know the family, residents family medicine residents utilize it, but I'm not so sure if you guys know about it. Um, this is a really neat study. It's a small study just to illustrate some of the more current stuff that's happening. This is an outpatient study, six, people 65 and older, chronic low back pain, randomized study. They looked at an intervention called mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, this is a very well-developed, specific approach to teaching meditation. It's eight weeks, 90 minutes a week. It was developed at the University of Massachusetts about 20 years ago. It has been used in a lot of medical settings. There's a lot of NIH-funded research on it now. Um, and in this particular study, they taught it to outpatients, uh, older people with chronic low back pain. These were their outcome measures. And it's a small study, but very nice results. Pain acceptance improved for the meditation group. Now, you notice it was pain acceptance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the issue, it's kind of what you were talking about. A lot of the issue with mind-body therapies for chronic pain, you may not change the underlying cause of the pain. However, you may change the way that the patient feels in relationship to the pain. And as you know, that has all kinds of connections to medication requirements, accompanying symptoms, et cetera. So this is what they found, pain acceptance improved. Physical function also improved. Uh, interestingly, because I think this is one of the big barriers. The majority of patients continue to meditate three months later. I think a lot of times why we don't bring this into the care of patients is we're like, oh, they'll never keep doing it anyway. A lot of the data says that a decent proportion of people do continue. Uh, it's not always a majority. Sometimes it's a third. But regardless, there are people who continue to really make a part of their life. And really importantly, half the people in this study needed less pain and sleep medications even three months after the intervention was over. So this is a small study. You know, it's not earth shattering, but these are the kind of findings that repeatedly come out of uh, applying mind-body therapies to um, uh, chronic pain conditions. Uh, here's another great thing, obviously, you guys need to know about if you don't already. This was from Sinai. This was a study that looked at a brief 15-minute hypnosis intervention done by a psychologist uh, <coughs> for people going through, this was outpatient, but surgical breast biopsy. So people were randomized. They either had empathic listening, how's it, how are you doing today, just talking for 15 minutes, or a brief uh, hypnosis intervention. And people in the hypnosis group, less interoperative propofol, less lidocaine. People had less pain, nausea, fatigue, discomfort, and upset. And really importantly, from the sort of hospital administration point of view, patients in the hypnosis group cost the institution $772 less per patient. And mostly this was because they got out of the uh, operating room five, five to six minutes earlier. And operating time is so expensive that that translates into a huge savings. So in other words, you can squeeze in two more patients in a day into the OR because you did this. In the end, the hospital makes a lot more money. So, you know, they went on to argue in this article that you could pay for a full-time psychologist doing this treatment as part of your protocol and more than make the money back in terms of savings on OR time and medication use. Really neat study. This was in JNCI. This was a couple years ago already. So there's a lot of potential for this in the setting of surgery and procedures. A um, lot of uh, research also, this study's a little old, but a lot of research on uh, perioperative pain too. I know you guys probably get called for that a lot. This was guided imagery and music therapy. Uh, do you guys know about the music therapy yeah. service? Do you use that much? You do know about that. Great. What's the guided imagery on that? Guided imagery is, well, it, when you talk about mind-body therapies, you know, there are all these different ways to do it. 
Uh, a lot of them center on breathing. Guided imagery brings in this component specifically where you might be describing a quiet place to somebody where they feel very comfortable, where their pain drifts away. You know, so it's like a, uh, you will do a relaxation sort of intervention to get them into a relaxed state, and then you're going to describe certain images to them. And depending on the, uh, the person doing it, the protocol, in, in something like this, they had a standardized, you know, sort of taped protocol that everybody got. In clinical practice, you can really tailor the guided imagery to individual people. Um, we've had a, a, a sort of a modest program here for a while that's called Preparing People for Surgery, uh, which one of our, our nurse clinicians has run. She meets with people before the surgery. She, meets, she teaches them how to do a relaxation guided imagery, and then she meets with them after the surgery as part of recovery. Um, it's a little bit in hiatus because she's busy with another grant right now, but we've been doing similar things for quite a while. Uh, and they found in this particular study less medication use, better pain scores. There's one or two studies that actually show decreased length of stay. That's kind of hard to show. So many things go into that. Um, but perioperative setting is another place that this is potentially very useful. How does this work? The truth is we don't know. Uh, or, or, or we know a variety of ways that it probably works. It probably works in more than one way. There's a lot of uh, EEG and fMRI research going on now into this particular area. Um, there's an area in the frontal uh, cortex called the anterior cingulate gyrus that's specifically activated by a lot of my body therapies and has the, I'm the, this gets out of my expertise range pretty quick, but it has these down-going pathways to the thalamus where um, there, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, it's, there's, the interesting gyrus is in the cortex, but there's these pathways back and forth to the thalamus that connect to the downgoing pain pathways, and don't get me talking about it more than that because I'll make mistakes. But regardless, there's a lot of research going on to look at mechanisms, but these don't pan out in everybody. So in other people, this area may not be activated, they still may have pain relief. Maybe those are people where it's just about decreased anxiety and sort of the accompanying symptoms. One interesting thing is there is no evidence that uh, these therapies release endorphins. So in an extremely, I'm sure, oversimplified way, the implication to me there is they should be additive with morphine and other pain medications. It shouldn't be that we say, well, we're already maxed on morphine, the receptors are saturated, there's no way this is going to help. This is working in some other way, so we probably can view it as complementary additive uh, you know, uh, helping with the uh, impact. Uh, I think this is really important to increase sense of self-control, giving people something to do when they feel overwhelmed by the pain. I think that's huge. So that's in a nutshell about mind-body strategies. As I said, there's way more to say about that. And if you were going to identify areas where there is a real nut of evidence uh, for treatment of pain, that's a very strong area. This I'm going to talk about very quickly. I'm going to whip through here. This is not particularly relevant to inpatient management. Um, and honestly, to some degree, I don't know how relevant this stuff is to your outpatient clinic population too, mostly because all these things are not covered by insurance. They do have a cost. So this, um, there are some barriers, I think, to this for uh, a, an underprivileged or, or underserved uh, population. Having said that, there's some interesting things to see. Um, fish oil, I'm sure you all have heard about all the talk about fish oil as uh, protection from cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of evidence for uh, reduced chance of second MI, reduced chance of second stroke. There's questions about prevention of first MI in people with risk factors, etc. Fish oil appears to have anti-inflammatory properties. Now as a consequence of this, it's also, and this is just a little bit of how we think fish oil may influence the inflammatory pathways. So, you know, fish oil being omega-3, uh, omega-6 being the more typical oils in our diet, we know these enzymes, there's competitive inhibition of these enzymes. So when you stack the deck over here by giving fish oil, you're pushing over to this side of the pathway and ultimately, oops, shoot, well, I missed that. You, can I go back? Uh, what do you think? Oh, great. So ultimately, you're leading to, if you stack it over here, you're going to get more of the um, anti-inflammatory prostaglandins and leukotrienes. If the pathway is too pressed over here, which in the standard American diet where we eat very little fish and we don't take fish oils and we have lots and lots of corn oil, 
most people have a predominance of this side of the pathway and end up with much more uh, pro-inflammatory mediators. So the idea is just like we use NSAIDs, you know, to block these pathways at, uh, you know, at cyclooxygenase, just like we use steroids to block it somewhere else. You can use fish oils to influence this pathway in the direction of anti-inflammatory mediators. Now, the problem is the evidence, when you end up looking at it, is not tremendously strong for this. Uh, so although theoretically it should work and, you know, we're, we believe what we believe, so some of us believe it works, the evidence has not been great. There are some studies, but they tend to be small and um, yeah, so it's, here it is, but I, I, I wouldn't put all my eggs in this basket. Here's one, for example, it's from the 90s. This looked at rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, fish oil, 2.6 grams a day versus a mix of fish oil and olive oil versus only olive oil. And they did find significant reduction in symptoms with the higher dose of omega-3s. There are other small studies like this. They, it hasn't really been looked at in very large studies for pain syndromes. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but um, maybe that's going to happen or maybe it's not. Uh, one issue with fish oil is so many of our patients, because they have cardiovascular risk factors or other reasons, are going to benefit from this anyway. We tend to sort of toss this into the mix, thinking that it might add something, even though by itself there's not very potent evidence. Um, this is another interesting area, again, without a tremendous amount of evidence, but I sort of put it up here for your consideration as you go forward. This is a diagram you guys, or something like this, you're familiar with from medical school, you know, where the NSAIDs work, where the steroids work, et cetera. And the point of this is that there are a lot of herbal medicines with anti-inflammatory properties the same way. So uh, glyceriza, for example, is licorice. Glyceriza has a modest blocking effect on phospholipase. So it is thought to uh, potentiate steroids. When people are on steroids and they go on to licorice, it may be that it enables them to use a lower dose of steroids. There are other herbs on here that have natural anti-inflammatory properties. This is ginger. This is turmeric. You may have heard of some of these things. Um, so these are natural anti-inflammatories. When you look at the data for each of these by itself in a pain study, it's not overwhelming. There are some po a few little positive studies. It's not uh, tremendously impressive. Same thing though. They're extremely safe. The side effects are minimal. Uh, we sometimes incorporate this into treatment. When we do, we usually use one of these products that's a combination of different herbal medicines. Uh, there's one, for example, called Zyflamen that has ginger, turmeric, white willow. Now, as I said before, these tend to be a little expensive, so I'm going to kind of give this passing mention to you guys, just knowing that this is something many of your patients may be doing already on their own. Here's one little study of ginger, pretty decent-sized study, actually, uh, double-blind uh, study looking at osteoarthritis of the knee. They did find that even ginger by itself had a significant reduction in uh, knee pain. Um, again, one study, who knows how replicable that is, etc. Uh, it's more that this is an area for, of interesting potential than that. This is even in my outpatient treatment with a population that can afford herbs, I wouldn't say this is the mainstay of my approach to chronic pain. Here's a really interesting subject. If I, you guys know about glucosamine? So glucosamine used for arthritis. If you had to vote on whether the evidence supports glucosamine or not, what would you say? Who votes yes? Not, not, not. Okay, so a quick tour on glucosamine because it's sort of an interesting uh, to look at how we formulate our opinions about this. So glucosamine is from uh, shellfish uh, exoskeletons. Uh, it's been looked at in Europe for quite a while and, and then more recently in the United States for treatment of osteoarthritis pain. Uh, there were a number of studies that were head-to-head -head against NSAIDs, for example. Uh, this one showed equivalent effectiveness, it was a short study, but it showed equivalent eff eff effectiveness with ibuprofen with a lot less adverse effects. Uh, this one, which was in Lancet, showed uh, that it actually not only decreased pain, uh, but it maybe even changed uh, the loss in joint space that you see in people with arthritis. They followed people for three years. They found less joint space narrowing in the glucosamine group. Interesting. So, you know, you're looking at this, you think, well, that all looks pretty potent. Um, then there was a huge NIH trial, 1,583 patients, osteoarthritis of the knee. They compared 
glucosamine to chondroitin, which is another supplement that's used for this, to the combo, to Celebrex, to placebo. Six-month follow-up, and they want, we're looking for a 20% decrease in knee pain. So it looks like a really good study. And this is where you guys learned or reached the conclusion that glucosamine doesn't work because overall they were not significantly better than placebo in reducing knee pain. Okay, so if that's the banner headline, then yes, we toss glucosamine, it doesn't work, it's a lot of baloney. Here's the problem, is that sometimes the headlines about these studies don't really reflect what's going on in the actual study. And it's hard to find the time to dive in and try to analyze it, but if you looked at this study, okay, they had a placebo response of 60% in this study. Now, you know, what's a typical placebo response in a study? 30, right, 25, 30. So this, for some reason, nobody knows why, quite an aberration. So once you're looking at a placebo response of 60%, the potential to then find a difference where your treatment demonstrates effectiveness becomes very small. So glucosamine was effective in 64% of people. Celebrex was effective in 70% of people, okay? Celebrex did pass the bar of being statistically better than placebo. Glucosamine did not pass the bar. So the headlines that came out of this said glucosamine doesn't work. And from the strictest interpretation, they're right because, you know, these studies are designed to show it works better than placebo. It didn't work better than placebo. So the conclusion is it doesn't work. How, do you have a comment? Yeah, any reason why it has such a high placebo? No idea. Uh, nobody has been able to figure that out about this study. This, this study has been sort of dissected up and down. There were a hundred letters to New England Journal after this study. I don't think anybody knows why that was. Very unusual. So, but where this leaves you, the problem is glucosamine worked in 64% of people. Okay, so you're looking at people with a moderate to severe mostly, or moderate, at least moderate, osteoarthritis pain. You can't prescribe a placebo. You can't say, here's a placebo, go home and take it. You could prescribe Celebrex, but then you know there's certain toxicities. Or you could consider recommending glucosamine, saying, I'm not exactly sure if this will work in you. It works in a decent proportion of people. We don't quite know how it works. It's extremely safe. And you're going to help two-thirds of those people. So my question is, even in scenarios where we're not sure that one of these natural medicines is better than placebo, do we toss it or do we consider keeping it in the repertoire? Because it may have a place. I mean, I prescribe Celebrex all the time, but I do worry about it. I prescribe high-dose NSAIDs. I worry about it. I prescribe glucosamine. I don't worry about it. I worry about the cost to the patient because it's not covered by insurance, but I don't really worry about the safety. It doesn't have, a lot, it doesn't have any significant drug uh, supplement interactions. It's a safe thing to use. So it's just an interesting question to toss out to you guys. What is the role of... Uh, substances in your treatment of chronic pain that you're not 100% confident are better than placebo, but that you know to be safe, okay? And this is going to come back in a minute when we talk about uh, some of the manual therapies and even when we talk about acupuncture a little bit. Um, what is our relationship to this question of placebo, okay? Interestingly, there's been a couple of studies recently that have polled physicians nationally, rheumatologists, internists, and family docs, and they find that over 50% of physicians acknowledge that they regularly use medications that they know are not necessarily um, treating a given disease, and they use them for the placebo effect, things like NSAIDs and antibiotics, because physicians, something like 90 plus percent of physicians acknowledge that the placebo effect is an important tool and that uh, they want to use it somehow. They can't prescribe straight up placebos. So one of the questions I have that's out there is, if we feel that the natural medicines are safe and have some potential to work, maybe there's a role for them also there when we think we want to use the patient's uh, potential for placebo effect and we want to do it safely. Just a thought. Not that we don't have to go out there and try to prove that these things work. Um, one interesting smaller finding of this study was that glucosamine plus chondroitin in patients with more severe pain was significantly better than placebo and was also better than Celebrex. So 80% of people on that combination of glucosamine and chondroitin 
had significant improvement in their pain. So that in itself is a bit of an important study. So I think the take home from that is if you are going to use this, you may want to actually prescribe the combination products. Now those costs, they're not covered by insurance. They cost in the neighborhood of $20, $25 a month. So this is not a, a, this is a potential problem for some patients, but for other people they're willing to do it. It doesn't work instantly. It's not for acute pain management. It takes usually anywhere from two to four weeks to really come on. There are no major interactions. Uh, people with shellfish allergy do not react to glucosamine because it's not the protein, it's not the meat from the shellfish, it's just the exoskeleton. So there's no question of anaphylaxis. So we're thinking about it. I mean, What's sorry. The dose? the dose is um, 1,500 of glucosamine in a day and 1,200 of chondroitin. And when you go out and buy a product, uh, Cosamin or, you know, any one of the ones that's out there, they tend to have the proper dose. Um, one thing for people to know, I only know this because of my mom, who takes this for her lumbar stenosis. Um, uh, American Association, AARP, uh, which you can join if you're over 50 for $10 a year, has a great uh, catalog. And any patient, and they have tremendous discounts. So you can get these things for like half of what you get them in the stores. So any of your patients who are over 50 that are interested in this stuff, it's really worth joining AARP and ordering the, because they have, they vet their products so the patients know they're getting good quality products. The prices are fantastic. So it's so just a resource for your patients to know about. AARP has all kinds of benefits. So if you're, oh, I just turned 50 and I'm not thinking of myself as old, but I am going to join it. Um, so regardless, this is what that study concluded, and this is why doctors in general have that belief, but I think it's still worth looking at a little more deeply. Okay, on to the next subject. And, and same thing, there's a lot more to say about supplements. For example, if you're talking about neuropathic pain, and this is one of the things they talk about in this article here, um, uh, alpha-lipoic acid, which is a supplement that has uh, been studied fairly, which actually we had, we had a study here that... Um, uh, Ricardo did on uh, fatigue, not on pain, but on fatigue using alpha lipoic acid, um, which I don't think we found it worked for that. But it does work reasonably well for neuropathic pain. And this, for example, is in this uh, pain January 2000, January 2011. Uh, now, ALA is expensive. So it's 600 milligrams a day, and you know, you're talking about 30, 40 bucks a month for that. Uh, but they call it level A evidence here. For, uh, um, for neuropathy pain, neuropathic pain. So what I'm, my point is, around nutritional therapies, you'll find a lot of little bits and pieces, particularly if you go looking for studies examining a particular kind of pain with a particular supplement. Um, one thing you should know about if you're looking for a good resource here, I'm sorry I don't have a slide of this, the website for NCAM, which is, the, as I said, the NIH branch, has a, a, a whole page for healthcare practitioners that is kind of a, a evidence-based analysis of uh, complementary alternative medicine approaches. So it's uh, NCAM, N-C-C-A-M dot N-I-H dot gov. And it's really kind of become the definitive resource if you're looking for information about what evidence is there for a specific therapy or uh, a specific herbal medicine, or you want to know about drug-herb interactions, or you want to know about for anything you want to know about, really, uh, if it's known, that site will link you to a resource for it. So it, it's kind of become a one-stop shop for a, uh, a vetted, non-commercial, reliable, evidence-based um, uh, place to go for that info. So I'd really recommend you, you take a look at that. This is from uh, Annals in 2007. This is from American Pain Society. You guys maybe know about this already. This was a review looking at non-pharmacological therapies for acute and chronic low back pain. And they found good evidence that CBT exercise, spinal manipulation, and that includes both chiropractic and osteopathic, interdisciplinary rehab, moderately effective for chronic or subacute low back pain, fair evidence that acupuncture, massage, yoga, functional restoration, also effective for chronic low back pain. So this is 2007. The implication here is that adding any of these things to usual care is going to get you better outcomes. So this is kind of what I meant. Uh, I mean, this is a clinical practice guideline. So this is kind of what I meant when I said, if you're managing a chronic pain patient without 
thinking about what are you doing beyond pharmacotherapy, you're not quite there in terms of meeting the guidelines for your field. So I just want to point that out to you, and I know that you guys do a lot of that, but I also know clinic gets busy, practice gets busy. We're, I see this with the family practice residents all the time. We're just in the habit of writing prescriptions, and it's really easy to leave it there and not think beyond to what else are we doing. You know, at the point of this review, same thing. We don't have a lot of good head-to-head -head trials, and the ones that we do don't really show conclusively that, you know, for example, there's a couple of trials of chiropractic versus PT. They come out the same, more or less. Uh, there's a couple of trials of massage versus chiropractic. They come out pretty much the same. So it's not quite clear that it's even that important which one you pick. In some measure, which one you pick may be dictated by what does the patient have access to. So for example, chiropractic is covered by a lot of health insurance plans. Acupuncture is covered by some. PT is covered by almost all. Uh, yoga may be not covered, but it might be cheap, and it might be something the patient likes. Massage is tough because it's not covered by anybody, and it's not cheap. So, you know, your decision about which one you recommend may really depend on what's available in the setting you're working in, uh, what's available under the patient's insurance, uh, you know, rather than that we know this is the one that's most effective. Um, but the point is you really should be thinking about doing something. So we'll talk for a minute about the manual therapy options. Um, I think I'll skip through this one because it's a bit too old. Um, this is osteopathic manipulation. I don't know if you guys have any DOs in your fellowship program. Do you? Yeah? Do you do any manipulation stuff? Bit, yeah. You do? Great. I mean, we, we, I've learned a lot about this in family medicine because, because we kind of have this, you know, integrative or holistic angle to the program. We tend to attract very good DO residents, so we always have a couple of DO residents, and they actually have an OMM clinic at, at Phillips, at Family Medicine, uh, every two weeks where they, you know, the residents do, they have a faculty of supervisors, and the residents do manipulation. And we're not studying it, but they get some amazing results just anecdotally. Uh, the problem with osteopathic manipulation, like chiropractic, uh, like acupuncture, uh, like mind-body therapies, is how do you do a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial? What's the placebo, right? If, if you're going to have a blinded trial, the patient has to not know that they're in the placebo group. If you have a placebo that doesn't involve touch, the patient's going to know they're in the placebo group. Any therapy that involves touch has a nor higher than normal placebo effect because people like to be touched. It's just part of the human experience. So uh, the big problem is um, how are you going to prove that this works using our conventional methodology? And it's really hard. So in some measure, they're moving now towards comparative effectiveness studies looking at osteopathic versus massage or osteopathic versus acupuncture. That's going to be much more productive in the end. Uh, this is a, an older study. It was in New England Journal, though, which is something. Uh, and they, they found uh, osteopathic versus standard medical care. They didn't see a big difference in pain. They did see less medication use in the osteopathic group and that they needed less PT. So not tremendous. It's more there just to show you there are a few studies of OMT. This is a systematic review from 2005, but not a lot of trials. With what they had, they said OMT significantly reduced low back pain. So what you're going to see with all of this is with manual therapies, the evidence is much less potent than it is with mind-body uh, and also even than it is with acupuncture. Uh, here's an interesting study. This is from uh, UMDNJ in Newark, actually, and they're now replicating this with a bigger grant. Uh, massage therapy for osteoarthritis of the knee. Who would think? You don't think of massage for arthritis. For some reason, it really worked. They just used standard Swedish massage. They found significant decrease in pain. Now what they're doing is they're doing a larger study where they're comparing different doses of massage because they convinced NIH that there's no good placebo. So they were able to get a comparative effectiveness grant to look at this. Uh, one interesting thing about massage, it's really hard to do uh, systematic reviews because there's so many different massage techniques. But one thing that comes out in the reviews that I'm in very interested in, oops, is that uh, acupressure style massage, which is where you use acupuncture points, mm -hmm. but just manual pressure, ends up looking like, so far based on the literature, 
probably the strongest kind of massage, at least in terms of relieving low back pain. And interestingly, acupressure massage is something that I do this with the family practice residents. You can teach how to do specific points without really knowing everything about how to do massage. So it may be something that's a little bit portable um, and it certainly needs more research. There's, there's some very good studies looking at acupressure at specific points for treatment of nausea. There's a point, I don't know if you guys know about this, but there's a point on the wrist, it's called pericardium 6, that has been examined up and down and now meta-analyses too of uh, post-operative nausea, so in other words, uh, post-anesthesia nausea, chemo-related nausea, um, and also morning sickness and pregnancy. And just acupressure on this one point seems to work quite well for treating that nausea. I think there's a lot of potential there, not enough study yet. So with the manual therapies, I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of uh, reason to be excited, and the evidence is not impressive. Um, so let me move on and talk about acupuncture. Um, how many of you guys have had acupuncture? One? Okay. Yes, it is needles, but the needles are tapered and very thin, and they're not hollow like our hypodermic needles, so they hurt a lot less when they go through the skin. So when you're talking to patients about acupuncture, um, yes, they are needles, but the kind of pain they cause is nothing like what you experience with a blood draw or a shot or an IV. Now, you guys actually had one of our acupuncture fellows in the outpatient clinic for a while. That may have been, bef we haven't had that maybe for over a year now, so you may not uh, have experienced that. Um, but we do have uh, acupuncture fellows who work in the hospital. They work on uh, ortho floor, they work on oncology, they work on family medicine, they work a little bit on medicine. And it is something that's available to you guys if you uh, are doing a pain consult and you think somebody might benefit from acupuncture. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of information around about how to access the consult service. They we don't have a big enough staff of fellows that can't always make it immediately. Sometimes it's going to be the next day. Um, but. Uh, it's a really nice service that we have available in the hospital. We're interested in expanding it. It's mostly been utilized by the surgeons uh, and by family medicine so far. It hasn't been quite as widely utilized by some other services. So I'll just show you a little bit of the evidence for acupuncture. Uh, lots and lots of studies now. This is an NIH-funded trial. It was published now in 2004. Almost 600 patients, osteoarthritis of the knee. They used what's called a sham needle, which is a, 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 uh, this funny little device where it touches the skin with a sharp device, but the needle doesn't go in. So it's like mimics acupuncture, and they've studied that patients can't tell the difference. Patients in this study laid down, and they had a curtain in front of their face, so they couldn't look and see if they had real needles in. It was a very involved protocol. We, they found that acupuncture treatments led to significantly greater improvement in Womack score and Womack, pain, Womack function, Womack pain, than sham treatments. Uh, very nicely done, double-blind placebo-controlled trial came out with a positive effect. Here's one for migraine, a little more dicey. They used needle insertion in the wrong points as the control group. That's what they called sham acupuncture. And lo and behold, when you put needles in, you get an effect. So here they had that same problem that they had in the glucosamine trial. You had, if this is all placebo, that's a huge placebo effect. So you couldn't find a benefit in the real acupuncture group versus the placebo group. Okay? This is for migraine. Now, if you step back a minute again and ask yourself the question, okay, does acupuncture work for migraine? Well, the answer is no. But what about these 50% of people who got better? It's, even if it's all placebo, and you have a treatment that's safe, what about it? Is it worth a try? And these are rhetorical questions, and I know they challenge to some degree our commitment to evidence-based medicine, and I realize I'm being controversial. But it's very hard to do studies of acupuncture with an adequate placebo control. It may be somewhat impossible. So then what do we do? Do we toss it as an option? What about those 50% of people who got better? That's sort of sad for them if we toss it as an option because we can't come up with the right control group. Now, could it be that it doesn't work and it's all a lot of baloney? Yes, it could still be. You can't tell based on this. Um, 
But it's an interesting question because the studies in chronic pain conditions regularly find this kind of benefit, 50%. is quite typical. And it could all be placebo. It could be that they're getting a high placebo because it's a procedure, and procedures often do have higher placebo effects. We don't know. It could be some nonspecific effect of just sticking needles in people. Stick needles in people, their endorphins go up. Maybe that's it. Uh, we don't know. But it's an interesting sort of both practical clinical question and an interesting philosophical question to me. How do you, how do you what's the right way to bring this into practice? Uh, there's a lot more now what they would call pragmatic studies. Uh, Andrew is at Memorial. Have you met Andrew Vickers? Um, He's a brilliant statistician who's at Memorial. He works with your group, actually. Uh, not, not yeah, well, look for him. He's a, he's a nice guy. Um, this was a, what they call a pragmatic study. So they just compared uh, acupuncture access to usual care. This was in the National Health Service. And they found that people who were randomized to acupuncture access use less medication, less visits to GPs, less days off, as well as having fewer headache days. Now, they don't know that that's the acupuncture. That could have been just going to somebody, right? Because they didn't compare acupuncture to another active therapy. But the argument in this kind of strategy, which is called a pragmatic trial or an outcome trial, is that it doesn't matter. It's, it's an inexpensive, safe therapy, and look at the benefits. So that we may be able, to, at some point, to think about evidence and a relevant use of evidence that doesn't involve placebo. Uh, here's a huge study, a Cochrane review, uh, low back pain, acupuncture for low back pain, 2005 in spine. Uh, for chronic low back pain, acupuncture is more effective for pain relief than no treatment or sham treatment, up to three months. Uh, relieves pain, improves function better than conventional therapies alone. So, you know, this is 3,000 patients, Cochrane review. There's still controversy bubbling in the literature. There was a recent review in one of the pain journals that was a systematic, I guess it was a meta-analysis of systematic reviews. So it combined a bunch of systematic reviews. And they concluded no better than placebo. So there's still kind of percolating debate about this. Um, but Cochrane has been pretty firmly um, uh, clear that the evidence supports uh, acupuncture for chronic pain. This is a really another just, this is the last bit of evidence, and then we can have a couple questions if you want. This is a, there was an experiment in Germany uh, in the early 2000s where five insurance companies got together and decided they were going to pay for acupuncture as a covered service for a period of time so that they could actually get research done to find out if it worked. So all these researchers came and did huge, huge cohort trials. I mean, this study had 11,000 people getting acupuncture. And it was, had a nested randomized trial inside where 1,500 were randomized to acupuncture, 1,500 to control. And then they followed people in the non-randomized acupuncture group. And they were able to do this because the insurance companies were paying for the acupuncture, basically. And what they found, this is one of the most important studies in this area, because they were able to look at cost effectiveness. So they not only found that acupuncture improved function and reduced pain, but they found, I don't know if you guys know how to interpret this, I, I don't particularly know how to interpret quality adjusted life years, but they found that this is considered cost effective therapy, particularly in light of the clinical improvements. So they were able to demonstrate that not only does it help patients, but that in terms of what it saves, in terms of missed work, extra medication use, other therapies, surgeries, ER visits, et cetera, it emerges as cost-effective therapy. So I don't know what's happened with this in Germany. In other words, I don't know if from this has emerged a situation in Germany where everybody routinely can get acupuncture covered. But this kind of research ultimately really helps insurers, Medicare, other practitioners, you know, other uh, health, you know, payers uh, understand why they probably want to consider including acupuncture in terms of the treatments that people have access to. Um, so just to summarize again, pain is physical and psycho-emotional. We have to incorporate both these dimensions, and we always need to be thinking about pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. And I know you guys hear this rubric a lot. I know it's part of your treatment. But I guess what I'm really advocating is that when you think about, well, what does this mean, non-pharmacologic approaches, it's great that it means cognitive behavioral therapy or psychotherapy, but it can also mean, or, or physical therapy, but it can also mean 
other mind-body therapies. It can mean acupuncture, it can mean manual therapies, and there's really even a whole world of other things we haven't even touched on that can really add to the kind of responses you're going to get from your patients uh, if you keep your eyes open about where this field's going. So that's my whirlwind tour, and uh, if you guys have questions or, or anything else I can share with you, I'm glad to take questions. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, one thing I would say if you want is uh, we have a, a really excellent website. If you guys want to look at our website, it's called healthandhealingny.org. I'm sure there's a link off the main BI website, but you're probably easier to just go there. And it talks about how to access the services in our department. So, for example, if you have an acupuncture patient, you're trying to figure out how to make a referral, just go there. It has all the numbers and that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it's also got some good links to a lot of patient education and a lot of practitioner education, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd encourage you guys to look at it.